will we pass through AGI the same way? It was like, oh yeah, it happened. I, I think so. I think, yeah. I, I really yeah. think so. Because yeah. arguably AGI is here. Yeah. It's just unevenly distributed. Yes. Right. And there are lots of ways where the model is way smarter than me already. Mm -hmm. And I would never choose myself over the model. So OpenAI's chief product officer, Kevin Weil, just made an appearance on the Moonshots podcast with Peter Diamandis and David Blunden. And this was honestly one of the most insightful interviews I've seen in a while. Kevin doesn't really seem like a hype man to me. He tells it how it is. And when they start talking about what AGI as a product would look like, or how AGI might already be here and what that means, he comes across as grounded, but also pretty candid about just how fast things are actually moving. One of the first things they touch on is, of course, GPT-5. Kevin, being CPO, obviously knows the ins and outs of the model, but he doesn't really drop any new details. Instead, the conversation quickly pivots to what actually powers these models, compute. And this is where the interview starts to get interesting. Kevin explains how OpenAI is completely maxed out on GPUs at all times, and why GPUs will never become a commodity. Check this out. I mean, right now we I've are- i heard you have a few. We do have a few. <laughs> we, have, we have a little bit more than a few, but we're also completely maxed out at all times. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the reasons that uh, we talked about Project Stargate, where yeah. we're going in with a bunch of other groups and building out more than $500 billion of infrastructure. It, it's extraordinary. I, it's like com computronium that, covering the planet. Totally. I mean, just the, the more, every time we get more GPUs, they immediately get used, whether it's, you know, we can take them on the product side and use it to, you know, lower latency or speed up token generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, or launch new products, you know, take a product that's only available to pro users and bring it to plus users or free users. Or it just means that we can run more experiments on the research side. There's basically infinite demand for GPUs within these walls. Yeah. And that's why we're doing so much to build capacity. I'm really glad you said that because uh, there, there is a school of thought out there that GPUs will commoditize and it's just so wrong. It's so incredibly wrong. We're far from that moment at the it's, very it's, least. Yeah, I think we'll never that will never exist in the world. So, I, I, the, it's it's one of those things. It's like the internet, you know. Like you, every bit, every bit that we like lower latency, increase bandwidth on the internet, people do more things. Video used to be impossible. Yeah. Now video is every day because the capabilities are there. The network can handle it. Mm -hmm. The more GPUs we get, the more AI we'll all use. So that really sets the stage. Compute is the fuel, but also the bottleneck. And OpenAI is burning through every bit of it. I also like Kevin's comparison to the internet. As bandwidth and infrastructure got better, entirely new possibilities opened up. Things like live streaming high quality video from the phone in your pocket, which would have seemed impossible just a decade earlier. And the same is true here. The more compute we have, the more powerful and accessible these systems become. Which ultimately leads to this idea of a decentralized, super intelligent personal assistant that can instantly draw on the world's knowledge and apply it directly to your context. In other words, AGI, the product. Check this out. I have a question I've been dying to ask you. As the chief product officer, what does AGI look like as a product? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, does it just look like the chat GPT, but it can do anything better, faster? Well, I mean, chat is such an interesting um, format because it, I mean, it mimics like how do, how do humans communicate? Yeah. Uh, we, I can text you, we can write on the keyboard, but I can also talk and we can, you know, look at each other and, and tech, like a chat interface kind of gets at that full generality. Sure. So it's really powerful as a backdrop, but it's not the only interface. I think when you have AGI, your your model is going to be Everything. in real time creating UI on the fly to uh, to build the most like economical, you know, sensible solution for the thing that you're trying to accomplish. And you're going to have all kinds of software being created and like being thrown away because you can just produce it again in an instant. Yeah, that's the the, the vision when it's when you're just talking to it, it's really obvious that it's going to be super empathetic. It's gonna it's going to be, just, but then you know, you start to see the video generation. You're like, oh, wait. Yeah. Now, now I'm, my mind is blown. Like, I mean, because it, it can create scenes for me in real time. It can create images. It can create, yeah. you know, like entertainment. But also if I'm designing something, it can, like Jarvis, you know, create the design in thin air. 
And so now I'm thinking, okay, Johnny Ive is going to be working on something. Well, like, let's, let's talk about Let's talk yeah. about that one second. I always come back, by the way, to the, if you've read Ender's Game. Yeah, of course. You know, like the jewel in your ear. Yep. It can see what you see. It can hear what you hear. But it also is super intelligent and connects back to, you know, the information across the galaxy. Yeah. Like, that's kind of, I think, where we're going. So, yeah, that's Kevin's vision of AGI as a product. Not some sci-fi robot, but an always-on assistant that's multimodal anticipatory, and personal to you. And here's where things get really interesting. Because if that's what AGI looks like, you can argue we're already there. In fact, Kevin points out that we basically cruised past the Turing test without even noticing, something people thought would be the holy grail for decades. And it just kind of happened in the background. Which raises the question, will we do the same with AGI? Will it just arrive? And most people won't even realize it. Here's how he explains it we just cruised through the passing of the Turing test and didn't notice. Isn't it amazing? It's crazy. It's it, like, it was held up for like 50, 60 years yeah. as this pinnacle. And then we just like whooshed right. by it. What is yeah. the effect? People we don't talk about it anymore. Like so quickly. And, and so they, miss, they miss the implications because they're already on to the next, oh, I took it for granted. Like, yeah. no, no, you got to think about what, so what can you do is, it now? It's, it's, it's like right here in our hands. Will, will we pass through AGI the same way? It was like, oh yeah, it happened. I, I think so. I think, yeah. I, I really yeah. think so. Because, yeah. Arguably, AGI is here. Yeah, it's just unevenly distributed. Yes, right. And there are lots of ways where the model is way smarter than me already, mm -hmm. and I would never choose myself over the model. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then there are lots of places where the model is definitely not smarter than me yet, and I would choose myself. But over time, I'm kind of staying. You know, I'm, I'm improving a little bit, hopefully. <laughs> but the model's getting better a lot faster. The, the level of water is rising. So, what do you guys think about this? Have we already reached AGI and just didn't notice? The same way we kind of cruised past the Turing test. Because if Kevin's right, then all we really need is more compute. Now, personally, I think there's still a crucial missing piece to AGI that we haven't built yet. And that's either embodied humanoid robots that can actually interact with the physical world, or advanced world models that can reason about reality at scale. Without one of those, I don't think you can truly call it AGI. But either way, GPUs are going to be needed, a lot of them, and the race right now is about compute. That's why this next part of the conversation stood out to me. OpenAI isn't just buying GPUs anymore, they're actually designing their own chips, and even using AI itself to help do it. Check this out. Yeah, there's a lot of work going on for a custom chip design that's designed by AI to be oh, yeah. specific. I, do you have a whole strategy around that? Are you working with, with you know, with Yeah, that's, that I mean, that's one of those areas where... Um, where you can let the model think, and it's a pretty well constrained problem. Yeah, right. There's totally. a, there's an optimization great function that you can hill yeah. climb on, and you can run tests and understand if your layout is better than the previous layout. Yeah, and the more time you give the models to think about it, the more breakthroughs they make. So I, I actually I, I'm with you. I think that's one of the areas where we're going to see. I mean, we already are seeing real innovation, right? I believe Google has been public about the fact that they've designed their TPUs and improved them with AI. For you sure. know, we're doing similar things. But I think like... if you if you talk to Noam Sh Shazir or anybody over there, the, the the historically the TPU team has been way the hell over here, and the algorithms team is way the hell over there. And trying to translate your algorithmic idea into something that the hardware guys understand is just a nightmare. So that's been a very slow process. But at now, because the AI will do it for you, it'll yeah. do the chip design right off your software design. Right, that's going to be the big unlock. And I don't know if it's like this month. It's not, it's not more than what? Oh, I nine? think it's already happening. Yeah. It's already happening. And you have a, yeah. do you have a team here doing specifically that? Yeah, we're working on our own chips. And, and that's all. we would be crazy if we weren't yeah, also right. using AI to improve our chip design and layout and everything. Do you have all the manufacturing and, and fab all figured out too? Is that, is we're working it? with partners on that for sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, there's this class of problem where you have a, a fairly well, it's a, it's a specific problem. And you have a way that you can grade it, in this case, you know, speed of, of the chip that you design. Mm -hmm. And in problems like that, we have, you have these well-specified problems. You can just iterate and iterate and iterate and apply arbitrary amounts of GPU. And so far, I think we're going to see arbitrary amounts of improvement. I, I totally agree. It's, it's crazy exciting. So that's where OpenAI is headed, scaling beyond GPUs, building their own chips, and even using AI to design better AI, just like Google. It's this self-reinforcing cycle of more compute, more powerful models, and then an even greater need for more compute. 
But that leaves a much bigger question hanging over all of this. If we really are on the edge of AGI, this always on super intelligent assistant that can make better decisions than you can, and if infrastructure is being built out on the scale of Project Stargate, a $500 billion deal, then what does that mean for us? Because at the end of the day, this isn't just about achieving AGI as a milestone. It's about advancing the frontier of knowledge and shaping the future of the human race. So what role do humans play in a world where so much of what we can do can be automated by these hyper-intelligent, contextually aware AGIs? Well, that's where Kevin actually pushes back on the dystopian WALL-E vision and offers a pretty interesting perspective about human purpose in an AI future. Take a look. I think the importance of purpose yeah, is still going to totally agree. be, right? Because one of my biggest concerns about the future of, you know, the endpoint here is when everything is being done for you, it can be done for you, and you can just sit back and be, a, you know, a couch potato. Mm -hmm. The thing that's going to make you live in a, in a Star Trek universe, not a Mad Max universe, is purpose. Yeah. Like, so that importance and yeah. You know. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think the, I always have a hard time with the futures that people paint when it's like, oh, we're all just going to sit back and, you know, eat grapes and write poetry and receive our UBI. Because I just, I don't think that's what drives us as humans. Like, if you go back and look at, we don't have to like, you know, cross the United States on a, in a covered wagon. We don't have to, to hang our laundry on clotheslines as, you know, very much anymore. There's probably, if you go back a hundred years ago, people look at our lifestyle today and they're like, oh my God, everything is done for you. What are you talking yeah. about? Mm -hmm. um, but of course we take those time savings and go do more interesting stuff with it. Yeah. It's all, about, it's, true. All, it's all about time savings, right? One thing that's true is every single human, 8 billion of us have seven days in a week, 24 hours in a day, right? Mm -hmm. 365 in a year. And it's what you can do with that time that defines wealth, success, impact, everything. Yeah. And AI is the greatest, you know, time multiplier, period. And I think it's the most one of the most powerful parts of human nature that we all strive for something bigger than ourselves. And you want to leave the world a better place than you found it. And you know, like that's so innate to humans. It's, AI is not going to change that. It's just going to supercharge it. So yeah, that's Kevin pushing back on the dystopian outlook, arguing humans will always find something new to do, even in an AGI world. And whether you agree or not, the big takeaway here is clear. AGI may literally already be here. The infrastructure race is only accelerating and there's really no turning back now. If you found this breakdown useful, make sure to subscribe for more deep dives just like this. Feel free to drop your thoughts in the comments, and as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.